All right, so in the previous video, we talked about the general framework of the linear elasticity, and then we stopped after finding the stiffness matrix for the linear triangular element. Um, the stiffness matrix is defined for all elements like this, so this is true for all elements. And it's just that the specific choice of element will give you a specific B matrix. Um, so this is specific to every element. And the same is true for the force vector. So the force vector due to the body forces, this again is true for all elements. But the specific shape functions are specific to each element type. And the same is true for the <clears throat> for the traction, for the force vector due to the boundary tractions. Um, so what I'm gonna do for this part of the lecture is we're just gonna talk about what do these force vectors look like for the constant state strain triangle. And if you <clears throat> recall the constant strain triangle, we have the shape functions directly in terms of X and Y. I just wrote completely the first shape function and then for the second and third shape functions, just left this constant right here. Uh, but these are linear constants of X and Y, I can take derivatives, right? So given this, uh, the nodal coordinates for an element, I get the shape functions, I get the derivatives, and then I can build by me my B matrix and I can do this integral because the B matrix is constant and the D is constant. The integral is just multiplying by the area. So that's how I can get the stiffness matrix. For the force vectors, I'm gonna take a shortcut right here. So the force vector would be the integral of the vector, the matrix with the shape functions times the body force vector. And that one actually you might have to compute the, the integral depending on how this looks like. So the the shape functions are just um, the, the linear functions that we defined earlier. But in order to do this integral, you may or may not be able to simplify it. If you recall what we have done in the, in the heat transfer problem is we defined the force vector for a specific type of problem where the source term was constant, for example. So here we're going to do something similar. If the body force is interpolated at the nodes, meaning if we have an element, say this is some element with nodes 1, 2, 3. So these are the local known numbers. And then instead of having a constant body force, we have a body force that is we have the nodal values of a body force. So let's say for this, we know B1X, B1Y, B2X, B2Y, and then B3X and B3Y. If we know these values and the, the body force is interpolated inside of the triangle linearly, then I'm gonna I'm not gonna do the derivation, but if the so if <clears throat> if B is linearly interpolated based on nodal values. So if you have the values of the body force at the nodes, then you can simplify the the integral. And I'm, again, I'm not going to do the derivation, but but then you don't need to do that yourselves. You can just look this up. So this is if you actually work out the integral, this is what you would get. So it's area of the element divided by 12 times this linear combination of the body force at the different nodes. And note that this is a six by one vector. So this is a six by one vector. 
and this is because the the triangular element has three nodes and each node has two degrees of freedom so that's why you you end up with a force per degree of freedom so that's why you get six so two two forces per node um that's it so that is for the <clears throat> body force vector and if you want to look at the derivation i think it's in the book or you can ask me during office hours and i can cover that then boundary attraction this is as tricky as it was for the for the heat transfer problem so for example assume that the edge made out of nodes one and two is the boundary that has attraction boundary condition and in that case we need to integrate the shape function over the edge right um, uh, times the traction and then this is different from the heat transfer problem in because we have now traction in x and traction in y and also i'm complicating it a little bit with respect to the heat transfer problem because in the heat transfer problem we did a constant flux so here we have different flux at the different nodes. So I'm assuming that the flux may change linearly. So the traction may change linearly for both the X and the Y direction. So for the edge made out of nodes one and two, what you should consider is that the shape functions one and two are the ones that are non-zero over this edge. So similar to what we had before, now this is different because diff difficult to imagine but if you so this t1y and t1x and t2y and t2x are actually in the plane but this um, green line that i'm plotting imagine that that sort of pops out of the of the page so the shape function one you know that this is um out of the plane so this is you know x y and then z sort of goes out of the plane uh, so the shape function one is one at node one and then goes to zero at nodes two and three. Therefore, it is non-zero over the edge one two, right? So n one is non-zero over edge one two, and therefore you will get now you get two contributions so you get so these two contributions well actually not those two the ones that are due to the node one are this one right here so this one is the contribution by shape function one and this one right here Actually, no, this is wrong. So the the two contributions are yeah, the first two. So these are both corresponding to node uh, shape function one, but X and Y components. <clears throat> and uh, just to to compare this with the with the heat transfer problem, in the heat transfer problem, let me just write it here. So in the heat transfer problem, if I had a similar um, triangle with some flux Q bar, what I had was that in order to to have this integral here, if the flux was constant, hopefully you remember what I did last time. I don't have X and Y components. I only have a um, scalar field for the flux. So in this case, I would put length over so if the flux was constant i would put just length of the edge over two times the flux right times the two shape functions that contribute to that edge and zero for the shape function three so this is if the if the flux was a constant um, and then if the flux we didn't do this right um, for the heat flux but if the heat flux varies linearly so if i had had a case that was 
we didn't have this case, but imagine that I had Q1 bar to, to Q2 bar. So imagine the flux actually changed linearly over the, the edge of the triangle. So in that case, actually my heat flux vector would have been similar to this one, would have been length over six times two Q1 plus Q2, <clears throat> and then also two, uh, sorry, Q, in this case will be Q1 plus two Q2, Q1 plus two Q2, zero. We didn't actually got to this point. The, the only one that I did for the heat flux was a constant heat flux, but I want to generalize a little bit for this one. Uh, but again, so you have two entries because nodes one and two are contributing to that edge. <clears throat> and then node three doesn't contribute. So similarly here, because of N1, but now we have instead of a single contribution to the force vector, we have two because we have X and Y. So from N1, the contribution would be two and the values of X and Y at node one times the values at node two. And then for node two, the shape function associated with node two is also non-zero over that edge. So it's like this, right? And then in particular over the edge, this is non-zero. So now that one contributes to these two terms. And then node three doesn't contribute because node three is zero over the edge. And you can see that now we have length of the edge over six. So L is the length of the edge. So it's similar concept to what we did in the, in the heat transfer problem, but now we have X and Y components. And also we, now I am allowing it to very linearly from one node to the other. So before we had a constant uh, flux over an edge, now we have a very interaction. So we have, for example, T1X to T2Y or T2, uh, T1, T1X to T2X or T1Y to T2Y. <clears throat> Let me just do another example. Uh, so this one is just for comparison. You can ignore this for But let me just do another example for the for the traction. So imagine that I have another element which has nodes one, two, three, but now I have a traction over the third edge. So here I have T one X T one Y and I have some T three X three t three y and i have nothing at um at node two so this is the edge that i'm interested in and so i want to compute for this element the force vector associated with the tractions which i know is the integral over the the boundary of n times the tractions right so in this case this is a six by one vector <clears throat> So this will be, you know, integral of the shape functions. So the first shape function times Tx, integral of the first shape over the boundary, right? Times Ty, integral of the second shape function times Tx, integral of the second shape function times Ty, integral of the third shape function times tx and integral of the third shape function times ty. And again, you can already see that node two will have no uh, nothing to do over the edge one three. So, you know, this, these two are going to be zero because 
So this is because n2 is 0 over edge 3, 1. So we don't need to worry about that. And then for as for the other two, the other two are non-zero, and you can just sort of follow what we did from the edge one two. So in this case, the force associated with the traction is going to be length of the edge over six. So length of the edge over six. And so for the first shape function, so this one will be n1 tx, the <clears throat> the tractions corresponding to this node get two so they get a little bit more weight so this will be the x component so this will be two times t1x plus the component of x from the other node t3x and then for the y component it will be the same but with y two t1y plus three t3y then zero zero because no two doesn't contribute and then for node 3, we would have again 2 and 1, but the 2 now gets associated with the, the tractions of node 3. So this one will be t1x plus 2 t3x, and this one will be t1y plus 2 t3y. So again, note that for node 3, we get this contribution. And so, you know, we get more contribution for node 3 um, and node 3. And then for node 1, we get these two terms for the force vector.